The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Collectively, they are the Great Lakes. But admit it, you have a favorite. So tonight, we're going there. Which Great Lake is the greatest of them all? We'll debate that, then ask for your vote. Then we shift gears and continents to consider a story of water gone terribly wrong. A conversation about the devastating flooding in Pakistan and the role climate change played in that disaster. It's Wednesday, September 21st, and that's next on The Agenda. You can see them from space. They are an indispensable source of fresh water for millions. They are under threat, all that and more. But tonight we'll finally have the conversation about the Great Lakes everyone was afraid to have. Which one is the greatest of all? Here to pitch, which is the greatest Great Lake? And we're gonna go in order of size here, starting with representing Lake Superior, the anonymous creator behind the Twitter parody account at Lake Superior. He's somewhere ironically enough, in Michigan. Representing Lake Huron, there's Megan Leslie, president and CEO of the World Wildlife Canada. Getting into the spirit of things here, she's in our studio representing uh, Lake Huron. Now representing Lake Michigan. Walter Senzik, mayor of St. Catharines, past chair of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, he's also in our studio. Representing Lake Ontario, Serene Fox, artist and activist, she's in Barrie, Ontario also getting into the spirit of things, and representing Lake Erie, Tony Decker, lead songwriter and vocalist of the indie folk rock band, Great Lake Swimmers, and he's in our studio too. And it's great to welcome our guests on the line and those of you representing three great, great lakes here in our studio. We're gonna, Megan, we're not gonna quite do this like back in your days when you were a member of parliament. We're not I'm gonna- ready. I'm ready. Very strict rules, but we're gonna start with some opening statements here and we'll go in order of size. So Lake Superior, come on in here, Get us started and tell us why your lake is the greatest Great Lake. It's in the name. I am Lake Superior, as my infamous Twitter handle suggests. Lake Superior is the greatest of the lakes. It feeds the water for all other four, the four other Great Lakes and is large enough to contain all the water of the Great Lakes, including three extra Lake Eries. If that's not great, I don't know what is. Some strong points there, Megan Leslie. You're doing Lake Huron. That's the second biggest. What have you got to say? Well, it's hard to pick just one lake. So luckily with Lake Huron, you don't have to because it's <laughs> two lakes for the price of one. It is Lake Huron. It is also Georgian Bay. Mm. That is part of Lake Huron. So two different ecosystems, two different cultures, uh, two different experiences. Also some strong points there, Your Worship. What have you got to say? What I've got to say is that when you think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, this is like Goldilocks and the Five Lakes. And when you look at the Five Lakes, I'm gonna take you through, over the course of the next half hour, I'm gonna take you through why Michigan is the perfect lake. Unlike Superior, which is too big and too cold. The other one is Lake Huron, <laughs> is too rocky. Lake Erie's too shallow. Lake Ontario, I'll get into why Lake Ontario is not at the top, but Michigan will be number one at the end. Like Goldilocks, just right. Just right. All right, gotcha. Serene Fox, come on in here. Lake Ontario is the best because? Well, it is small, but it is mighty. Lake Ontario is actually, you know, you called it out. You said Superior had it in its name. But one of the traditional names for Lake Ontario is Nigani Gichigami, which means the leading sea, which quite frankly makes it the leader of all lakes. And if you follow my traditional migration story, you'll come to see just how important it is. So yeah, Lake Ontario has some of the most iconic coastlines in Ontario and Canada. So I'm looking forward to telling you just a little bit why Lake Ontario is absolutely the best lake. And we look forward to hearing it. Okay, Tony Decker, you're batting fifth in this lineup here today. Why is Lake Erie the best? Uh, Lake Erie is the best um, because uh, it's you, it's comfortable to swim in uh, all summer long. Um, there's beautiful beaches. Uh, it has uh, 
uh, uh, Point, Point Pelee and Pelee Island is a, is, a, is a through route for migratory birds, super important for, for, our, um, for our environment. Um, and uh, the Lake, lake Erie provides the lake effect that has, uh, creates the microclimates that's perfect for growing uh, fruits and vegetables and grapes in the Niagara region. So all of that stuff we enjoy from the Niagara region is a result of Lake Erie's uh, lake effect. I have to say, strong opening statements from everybody here. This may be more difficult to uh, judge than one had thought. So let's go around for a second round here. Okay, Lake Superior, come on in here. You gave us the opening statement. Let's dive in a little deeper now. You've heard some of the criticisms. Lake Superior's too big, it's too cold. What do you say to that? Too cold? There's no such thing as too cold. <laughs> There's just too weak. You know, there are part of Lake Superior's power are the intense conditions, the 30 foot waves, the um, blustery wave, the blustery winds and uh, the squalls It is a beautiful uh, to experience that inclement weather. All right, Megan Leslie, you heard the criticism over here. Lake Huron, too rocky. Oh, come on. So we have Lake Huron, and when you go, you know, Sarnia to Tobermory, it's got these white sand beaches. They're beautiful, lots of swimming, big waves. And then you do have the rocky shores of Georgian Bay, those iconic images of that, that white pine blown and twisted in the wind. So it's, I think it's really exciting and dynamic that you get the best of all worlds with just this one lake. It's very group of seven, isn't it? Isn't it? It really you is. You look like you're looking at a painting when you're you walk through the Georgia Art Gallery Bay. of Ontario and you're basically right there. Right on. Now, okay, Walter, I, I, I'm going to put this out here because I think maybe you have the toughest job of all the five representatives here. Because your Great Lake, is any of it in Canada at all? It's all American. It's got four states that touch Lake Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. Mm -hmm. So it is an American lake. There's good Americans out there. <laughs> and this is the great American lake. Hmm. And when you think of Michigan, you think of freshwater surfing. It actually has the best waters to surf in freshwaters out of all the freshwaters in North America. If you've ever been to Sheboygan, you know that you can surf in the Great Lakes. This is Sheboygan, Wisconsin? Sheboygan, Wisconsin, you ever been there? I have not. And so Gus Polinski and the Kenosha Kickers, Home Alone, I've got the t-shirt. You've got the swag here. I got let's a limited see, what, edition. What is that? Which, let's, uh, this Sheldon, is... which camera? Camera three. Yeah, let's yeah, show it over there. It's right there. Now, Gus Polinski and the Kenosha Kickers, the best polka band ever, <laughs> according to John Candy. <laughs> and I will tell you that when you think of Michigan, the waters themselves, it's pristine. It is the longest lake from north to south. And it really is that quintessential American lake. It's not bold and brash. Okay, like you think but I got to I got to follow up here. You do realize that you're on a Canadian television channel right now, and you do realize that you're the mayor of a Canadian city, and you're pitching a Great Lake that's all in the United States. But I was also the chair of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. Well, that's true. With 150 mayors that all touch the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River Basin, so we've got to be binational in our thinking. And the Great Lakes, you look at it as a binational body of water. We all have to protect it on both sides. So you're looking for extra marks for being very ecumenical right now. I'm looking for a lot of Americans to tune into the show and get me some <laughs> okay. votes. That's what no, I'm looking for. Okay, right no, now. we've got some Americans who watch. That's fine. Okay, okay. Let's go back to Lake Ontario now. Um, Serena, talk to us about this. The 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 history of Lake Ontario and the connection in particular that you have for it. Uh, expand on that if you would. Yeah, so I mentioned in my opening statement um, our migration story. So I grew up hearing our creation story uh, and part of that talks about prophecies. Uh, and it talks about the migration. So my people, the Anishinaabe, all came from the East Coast, um, out from the Atlantic Ocean. And it talks about a story, a time, uh, when our people moved uh, all across Canada, we actually ended up settling along, I'll give you a little shout out, Lake Superior, <laughs> along the shores of Lake Superior, but really along all of the Great Lakes. And so when you're thinking about Lake Ontario, it has these thousands of islands, uh, almost just shy of 2,000 islands. And uh, in those islands, our creation story actually talks about um, the creators stepping across those islands as they created this migration path for us. So for me, as an Indigenous person, maybe outside of what 
we all know as the iconic landscape. Um, I actually have a history of my ancestors footsteps along these shoreways. Um, and to me, that's really special. It holds my history. And uh, for all of us Canadians, it actually holds the history of who we are, um, how we settled, how we engaged in commerce. Um, so it starts with my creation story, but it's uh, become all of our story, uh, whether we know it yet or not. Hmm, very cool. All right, Tony, uh, speaking of history, you have personal mm -hmm. history with Lake Erie. You grew up on Lake Erie, yes? Yeah. Whereabouts? Uh, uh, yeah, I grew up in the in the, the small but mighty town of Waynefleet, Ontario. And where's that? Uh, that is, uh, let's see, uh, just uh, do kind of do south of... It's on the sort of the north the northeastern shore of Lake Erie. Northeastern. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and was it yeah. what was it like growing up on the lake? Well, it was it kind of created the backdrop for for our lives uh, in the summertime with the beaches and the swimming, um, but also um, uh, in the wintertime, uh, ice skating, uh, ice fishing. My brother and my dad and I would go out ice fishing every most winters when I was when I was younger. Um, and uh, it's now just, uh, I find it endlessly inspiring. It's inspired a lot of my music. Um, and uh, yeah, coming from a small rural town, um, it was, it really was, was created the backdrop for our lives growing up there. And what about the criticism that Lake Erie is too small, too warm to swim in, and too stinky with all that seaweed in there? Really? Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, it, it actually, among the Great Lakes, um, it, it, it's, it, it, uh, it, it, it sort of cleans itself the fastest because of its size. Um, so environmentally, the cleanup was was a lot faster, let's say, from, from the 70s till now. Um, and uh, it's kind of turned around the quickest, thankfully. So small, yeah. but mighty and manageable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. <laughs> let's go back to Lake Superior here. And I guess we should, uh, well, what should we say here? Lake Superior is sort of a, a, sat, a satirical Twitter account. 200,000 followers, which is not bad. Lots of sarcasm, lots of creativity on the account, uh, on the account rather. Lake Superior, how did that start and why is it floating your boat, so to speak? Well, the, the Twitter account's been around for about a decade and it does take on the voice of a very sassy, overly confident lake with a bit of a superiority complex. Uh, but that whole uh, voice is used to relay the, the message of a lot of Great Lakes scientists. Um, I'm not a scientist myself, but I love to relay their message um, from all the Great Lakes and their, their latest research. Um, so the, the comedy has been a great way to build the voice and to make it known that I am the greatest. <laughs> um, but it's all in the name of love for Great Lakes science. Well, I should follow up on that because the, the lake is not called the best. It's called superior which is just sort of relative, right? It's not superlative, it's just relative. Any problems with that? Well, I'd like to say, if, if you go to the account and look at the pinned tweet, um, without me, they would be called the Good Lakes. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's my presence that makes the lakes the Great Lakes. And I'd like to add, if I could go back to the earlier conversation, I'm the only Great Lake that has an entire national park inside of it being Isle Royal National Park. Okay, well, okay, M Megan, those sound like fighting words to me. Um, I mean, you've got Flower Pot Island, you've got mm -hmm. Manitoulin Island, which mm -hmm. is the biggest freshwater island in the world. Any other highlights on Lake Huron you want to tell us about? Well, I'll tell you about uh, Manitoulin Island, this sure. huge island in this freshwater sea, essentially. It has over 100 lakes on it. So it's lakes in a lake, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, I think when you think of uh, Lake Huron, you think of perch burgers, <laughs> you think of the incredible sunsets. There's, you know, it faces, well, from, from Canada, <clears throat> it faces west. And there's that was a shot. That was a shot. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, there's this beautiful uninterrupted skyline that is just like incredible for sunsets. It's got really everything that you're looking for. Hmm. We, we, we should also explain to people watching this or listening to this, uh, while we are doing this for educational purposes, we're also having an election. Uh, there's a poll out there, tvo.org slash Great Lakes. It goes until the 29th of September. So go on the website and you get to vote. This is an election. And my hunch is we're going to get better participation for this poll than we made for actually real elections. But I see you champing at the bit. Yeah, to get I, I want to go back to Lake Superior because Lake Superior reminds me of Tom Brady. 
And that in itself should, people shouldn't be voting for Lake Superior. Because if you listen to Lake Superior talk, it's all about me, 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 <laughs> and being the best, the best, the best. And he actually refers to himself as the gloat, Lake Superior. The gloat. The, oh, the, the greatest gloat. lake of all time. Yes. As opposed to the, uh, the goat. The goat, which is Tom Brady. Greatest of all time. Greatest quarterback of all time. Greatest football player of all time. Yeah. I'm not a Brady fan. Well, I used to be a Brady fan. But I'm just saying right now, he reminds me of Tom Brady. He should not be getting any votes. Lake Superior should not get any votes. Well, uh, Lake Superior, I don't see, I was about to say, I don't see you doing too much gloating. But actually, I don't see you at all. Now, maybe you could explain why you're <laughs> being anonymous with us here tonight. Well, I, I like to keep the emphasis on the, on the lakes because it's not about me. It is about the lake. And I don't need my personal identity to, uh, to inflate that message. So, but I, I won't argue. I mean, Tom Brady has more championships than anybody else. I have more championships than anybody else. And, and he's married to a supermodel. I, we think, we think, although that may be tenuous at the moment. Uh, yes, I'm Serene, still looking for my pay. Serene, are, <laughs> are, uh, Serene are, are, do you want to tackle Lake Superior in as much as he's making the case, but he's making it anonymously, whereas you are right there on camera, you know, being open and transparent for all the electorate? Well, I mean, I don't know how anonymous he's actually trying to be. I mean, I think that uh, Lake Superior is obviously trying to be the Banksy uh, of all Lake accounts here um but also i happen to find that his uh, shadow still takes up most of the best view of the lake so there we have it uh even in this screen divide here i can barely see the horizon at all so um <laughs> i bet to differ again taking out most of the credit and saying you are the voice of the lake um mm -hmm. and as an indigenous person what is the voice of the lake how uh, profound a place to mantle to people that i'd love to dive deeper in what that voice really entails. Man, it's on now. Okay, it's on. Uh, I should also mention here, all five of our guests here film videos vouching for the lakes that they are representing, and the agenda has begun to roll these videos out on our social media feeds. And we're going to look at some of the replies that we have received already, starting with this one. Uh, here's a Twitter user, Moose and Squirrel is the name, and it said, if the other lakes wanted to be as great of a lake as, say, Superior, they could have changed their name to Lake Most Amazing or Lake Super Duper. Also, get more water if you want to play with the big lakes. I'm looking at you, Erie. <laughs> Tony, Dems fighting words. What oh, do you want to man. say? Well, okay. I just want to mention one thing, okay? Uh, point, uh, Peely Island, okay, um, is uh, Margaret Atwood. You know, our beloved Margaret Atwood mm -hmm. has a home there. Um, and her and her partner, Graham Gibson, built a bird observatory there. And uh, Margaret Atwood has claimed that she has written most of her books, actually, on uh, uh, Peely Island. Um, so if that's not saying something about the, uh, you know, the value and the worth of, of, uh, of Lake Erie, especially to the arts, uh, which is a subject near and dear to my heart, um, then I don't know uh, what is. Um, Clearly inspirational yeah. to yeah. one of our great writers. Exactly. Huh. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. that's, that's a fair point. Now let's do, okay, Megan, this one's going to be at you. This is Lake Superior versus Lake Huron. Um, okay, another tweet. It says here, this is from Matthew Cohen, it says, Superior may be biggest, but the greatest of all time for kayaking mm. is indisputably Huron. Are they right about that? Yeah, I'm going to get serious for a minute here. Okay. Uh, there is extraordinary kayaking on, in particular, Georgian Bay. Uh, w when you are along those rocky crags, when there's uh, around um, Cyprus where the water is so, it's like Caribbean blue. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. I will say, uh-oh, I'm, I'm going to get into, uh, we had a little spat he's, in the, in the green the, room earlier. He's giving you the stink eye here. I can see it, yeah. There is some danger involved. Uh, there are some big storms. You got to know what you're doing. I've I've had a couple of moments where I've thought, okay, am I going to make it back in time before this storm? So you got to be careful. You got to let people know what's going on. But what an extraordinary place to see kayak and see see the lake from the lake, and you're you know actually in it, paddling around. Now, Superior, would you grant that Lake Huron's better for kayaking because your lake is simply too big and too angry most of the time to kayak in? All somebody has to do is Google some images of of. Uh, pictured rocks kayaking another national lakeshore of mine and those 60 to 80 foot cliffs along pictured rocks are breathtaking but yes i am i'm moody and um <laughs> that is that is a positive and should not be taken as um as a slight 
Well, uh, Serene, you're not going to like this one, but we're going to bring this one up anyway. One more tweet here, some reaction to some of the videos we put out there. Uh, our friends over at Great Lakes, uh, excuse me, Lake Ontario Waterkeeper chimed in with, and they're the, um, I guess, the longest running initiative of Canadian charity Swim Drink Fish. And they said, Lake Ontario is greatest as it is made up of all the lake's waters. Not a bad point. But Twitter user Alan Gary Bunyan was not happy with that, and he replied, Unfortunately, Lake Ontario is the toilet bowl of the entire Great Lakes system. Statistics indicate numerous health issues directly related to its position at the end of the chain. Okay, Serene, you're on. Ah, uh, it means that this lake actually requires the support of our nation more than any lake. Uh, we really need to protect it, and it means that it is proof that you can't actually isolate any of these lakes. We're talking tongue in cheek here about picking which one is the best, but all of these lakes are uh, intricately connected um, and rely on one another. Uh, and so Lake Ontario is the most vulnerable because they only have so many ways to clear their water uh, and they go right out to the Atlantic Ocean. So that St. Lawrence uh, waterway there, um, really, really important to protect and to watch and keep an eye on. So you're absolutely right. Uh, Toilet bowls are something we should be thinking about anyway, because we're throwing our waste into water and flushing it down and thinking it's going away. So wonderful symbolic, uh, wonderful symbolism here about how uh, Canadians really are treating their water. So we need to rethink that. Now, Your Worship, you've got to have a soft spot for Lake Ontario. After all, the, the city you represent yeah. is on Lake Ontario. Yeah, I was going to say that tweet almost was written by Goldilocks. Like that was that was a perfect <laughs> segue into that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do, I live in St. Catharines, which is on the shores of Lake Ontario. Neil Peart wrote Lakeside Park, famous rush, band player, mm -hmm. drummer, mm -hmm. and that was written right on the shores of Lake Ontario. So I do have a soft spot for Lake Ontario. But again, when we look <laughs> at Michigan and the role that Michigan plays, did you know that in Michigan there's like a Michigan Triangle? where when you go through on a boat or over by a plane, the navigation instruments get all kind of wonky. Seriously. It's, you could look it up. And I, I saw it on the internet, it's gotta be true. And so <laughs> when, you, when you look at that, it's, it's almost like it's an X-Files thing. That makes it cool. Like there's, there's a cool factor to Michigan that I don't really find with the other lakes. And again, Lake Superior, the best song that you have is from Gordon Lightfoot, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. That, that people died. That's what people think about when they think about Lake Superior, <laughs> at least when they listen to George Gordon Life. But I, I get that. Uh, okay, we should put that to Superior. I mean, the reality, he didn't call it Lake Superior. He called it the, the big lake they call Gitchigumi. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of tragedy in that lake once Oof. upon a time. Do you think people should take marks off Superior for that? Uh, lake Michigan is the deadliest great lake. So he can walk that comment back. Um, yes, there have been tragedies on all the Great Lakes, and water safety is is an, a dear issue that's important to me. I mourn the losses that I've taken um, and um, will preserve them for eternity. Nicely put. All right. We've all had a bit of fun here tonight, but uh, I think we want to leave this in, in a semi-serious way, in as much as, regardless of which one of you is the best... I think we all want to pitch in and make all of you even better. What's something that we could do that would improve and or take care of your particular lake better? Let's go in inverse order. Start us off, Tony. Yeah, I, I'd really like to mention the, um, the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper, um, who also does really great work on Lake Erie as well. Um, and they're part of the larger Waterkeeper Alliance. Um, we've had um, the, the opportunity to work with them uh, as a band and with our music for their uh, swim, drink, fish uh, program. And uh, I just think they're doing um, such fantastic work. And uh, uh, I think everyone should, should check them out. Good. Yeah. All right. Serene Fox, what can we do to help Lake Ontario? Well, thank you, Lake Erie, for lifting up the water keepers. I want to mention um, all of the generations of uh, Indigenous water walkers. I want to lift up Josephine Mandaman, who walked the shores of Lake Ontario to bring awareness to the health of our waters. And so, uh, and Lake Erie, I'm just going to shout you out because I'm waiting this whole time and really all the lakes. You may have Margaret Atwood, but did you know that I have Babe Ruth? So, Babe Ruth hit off <laughs> that first home run at Hamlin Point Stadium. And this is one of the great ways that maybe we can protect Lake Ontario. That winning home run ball 
it's still in Lake Ontario. So maybe a quest to find it and also help clean the, the lake bottom at the attic. So. That is a fantastic point. And you know, with, with the New York Yankees, Aaron Judge chasing, ba well, he's tied Babe Ruth now for uh, most home runs in a single season at 60. The Babe hit 60 and now Judge has 60. And good for you for reminding us that his first professional home run was actually hit in Toronto, into Lake Ontario, and they never found the ball. So let's get on that, Serene. We gotta go find that ball. That's a great point. Okay, who's next here? Uh, Superior, uh, excuse me, Michigan, you're next here. What can we do to help you? You can call me Superior, that's fine. <laughs> in terms of what's happening in, in, in Lake Michigan, it's the feeder coming in from the Mississippi River. So there's a place called Brandon Road. And the what we're focused on as the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative is making sure that Brandon Road is reconstructed to prevent the Asian carp from coming into mm -hmm. Michigan. If it comes into Michigan, it will it will change the ecology of all the Great Lakes. And so that is singularly one of the most important initiatives that the American government has to undertake. And I think the Canadian government needs to be aware of it because if the Asian carp, the one that can fly, that can jump over, over boats. They're terrifying. We've seen the videos. If yeah. they can come in and it's there's there's a lot of work being done, but if they break, if they breach Brandon Road, what you're going to see is a complete change over time with the ecology of the Great Lakes. So that's one thing that needs to be protected. Megan, what can we do for Lake Huron? I'm actually going to take it bigger to all the Great Lakes. As on Serene's point, they're connected, and what we do with one, we do with all. And also the land, because what we do on the land impacts the water. We know a lot. there's a lot of issues with runoff. If we can restore the shorelines, there's less runoff, more water's absorbed into the land, the, the health of the Great Lakes is better. So what anyone can do at home, organizations, whether it's water keepers, swim, drink, fish, local community groups, they need members. They need volunteers. They need donations. So find a few, sign up for their email lists, follow them on social media, see what they're doing, see if there are opportunities to raise some money for them, to go out and do some restoration with them. They need all of our help if we're going to protect these beautiful bodies of water. Great advice. Superior, you get the last word. Well, while I am the greatest lake of all time, together we are the greatest lakes of all time. And I think we'll all agree on that. Um, what I like to say is my tagline today is, is vote the gloat. Uh, but, but my message is that bears don't vote, eagles don't vote, fish don't vote um, for the problems and the environmental issues we see um, on our individual lakes and across the Great Lakes as a whole. Um, this is up to humans to fix. Um, um, we need to protect uh, the wildlife. We need to speak for the water, for the animals, um, for the greater environment. Um, and it starts with the vote, um, and it starts with involvement and, and speaking up and speaking up for the water. Um, but with that, I ask you to vote the GLOAT. <laughs> well, in fact, we can ask everybody to go vote, as we do uh, both for real elections and for this election here, because your vote matters. So go to tvo.org forward slash Great Lakes. The website, once again, tvo.org slash Great Lakes. You can make your mark. The voting runs until September 29th, so you got another week to vote, and you can have your say. And also, tune in next week. We do a deeper dive on the Great Lakes as part of our ongoing partnership with the Council of the Great Lakes Region. Go vote, everybody. And thanks to the five of you for appearing on TVO tonight and so expertly making your pitches for your five Great Lakes. Thanks so much. One third of Pakistan was submerged this summer in the worst flooding that country has seen in more than a decade. Hundreds killed, millions displaced. And while the waters are finally receding, the devastation and questions about the role of climate change are not. Let's find out more. With us now, three guests, all of them in Pakistan. In Karachi, Sahar Habib Ghazi, South Asia editor at Vice World News. In Shahid Benazirabad Division, Adarsh Lagari, communications officer at UNICEF Pakistan. And in Islamabad, Fahad Saeed, climate scientist with the global nonprofit organization Climate Analytics. And we're grateful to you three for making time for our viewers and listeners here on TVO tonight. Just before we start, uh, let's share these numbers, and I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, if you would, to bring these numbers up. Uh, it's astonishing what has transpired in Pakistan over the last many weeks. 33 million people affected, 
15,000 people injured, 1,500 people killed, and a half a million people living in relief camps. We'll now bring up a map, and I'll just sort of describe for those listening on podcast, the extent of the flooding is in those blue shaded areas, a significant part of the country. Total flooded area, 55,000 square kilometers. Adar, start us off here. What has the crisis been like for people on the ground in Pakistan? Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's unprecedented. We have seen floods before. 2010 and 11, we had seen floods. It, it was, again, a very devastating time. But these floods have not been seen uh, in history. I have spoken with elderly. I have spoken with, with the adults and, and families, and they have never seen rains like this. Uh, on the roads, wherever we go in the province of Sindh, which is the most affected in Pakistan right now, we will see, all we see is, is people on both sides of the road in makeshift tents, uh, just just survive, barely surviving, actually, not even uh, accessing clean drinking water. Uh, they're surrounded by families and children, surrounded by these stagnant uh, floodwater lakes that have been uh, now there for, for nearly a month, actually, sometimes over, a, some places over a month. And, uh, and, and now it is turning into a health crisis as well. Already uh, without clean water, without clean drinking water, without food, without shelter. And now, uh, as, as, the, as the system, the health system in the country struggles to meet the demand, the need, it's just, it's, uh, we have people who are now facing uh, imminent uh, health crisis. There are children that are dying. There are uh, people who are suffering uh, from malaria, from cholera, from and children and women suffering from malaria and cholera, and so many uh, gas-related diseases. So it's, it's, uh, it's it's and even just now in the district that I am the division where I am right now we are accessing sorry there's a there's a power cut here I, I yeah I, we understand we that. understand no not at all we'll, we'll we'll give you a moment here to get your power back up and so we can see you again in the meantime I'll go to Sahar and ask uh, Sahar in your judgment how well has the political leadership responded to this crisis well, you know, uh, the crisis is, um, the scale is so huge. They've never experienced, Pakistan has never experienced a crisis of this scale. And our leadership is very new. Um, our governments changed hands uh, just a few months ago. But I think um, they got on the uh, ground running in terms of um, doing what they needed to do. But the scale is unprecedented. You know, even looking at the data that you just laid out, it says 500,000 um, uh, in relief camps. But I went to one district with a population of 1.5 million, and 500,000 there were displaced. Hmm. So um, a lot of people are not in relief camps. They're living on the road. They're not even in tents. They're underneath branches and pieces of cloth. Um, any district you go to that's flood impacted, because it's been a few weeks now um, that the, the disaster really got to the scale that it was, you will see relief camps, but you will see many people who do not have relief yet, just because the scale is just... It's unimaginable. You don't you don't really get a sense of it until you go there and you see um, homes are just gone. Everyone has moved out to the roadside. If homes haven't been completely flattened and flooded, um, they're broken and they're not safe to live in. Hmm. Um, you know, and so the, the floods, the way that it happened is Pakistan has one of the, the longest rivers in the world. It's called the Indus River, and it's fed by. Um, glaciers that are melting uh, in the north. And then the river goes all the way to the south of the country and it lands in, um, it goes into the ocean where I am in Karachi. And we're not seeing this water draining. The monsoon rains have pretty much stopped the last few weeks, but the flood water is still there. It's not draining. And we just see this flood water moving through city to um, town to village through barrages and dams. Um, and it's constantly impacting uh, impacting people. We're still seeing deaths happening from flooding, even though the rains have stopped. Well, let me go to Fahad on that. So why, I, is it that uh, why is it that the monsoons have not subsided or the water has not yet drained? Uh, thanks, Steve, for having me. So, uh, yeah, this time, uh, as uh, the fellow speakers have said, that we uh, received unprecedented rains, especially in the southern provinces of Pakistan, the Sindh and Balochistan we are talking about. So those provinces basically have a, have a dry climate. They don't receive uh, uh, monsoon rain and that, uh, of that extent. So, for example, this time the province of uh, Sindh has received eight times uh, more rains during the month of August. Uh, as compared to the, their long-term average. And similarly, uh, Balochistan received seven times more rain. So you can imagine if 
you receive that uh, amount of a rain in uh, in uh, one month uh, i mean any infrastructure is going to struggle so the, what happened uh, Steve, this year that uh, the uh, uh, the monsoon depressions, as we call them, which originates from Bay of Bengal and which hit the north, northern part of the countries after passing through uh, India, instead of going northward, they uh, took a strange trajectory and they hit uh, the southern provinces of Pakistan, mainly the province of Sindh, Adash was talking about. So it is not uh, one uh, depression, not two, but six to eight of them which brought that much uh, uh, rainfall in Pakistan. So, uh, and uh, uh, as soon as we got that uh, flooding in Pakistan, people started to talk about climate change. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a new field of science uh, through which you can uh, attribute a particular event uh, to whether climate change has caused it or not, uh, which is called climate change attribution. This, this is a kind of a new field, but it is gradually getting mature with time. And now we have uh, uh, models, climate models, through which you can quantify that what is the role of climate change uh, uh, what kind of a role climate change has played in exacerbating a particular incident? Okay, can you follow uh, up so, on that? Tell us, tell us what you believe. You're the client, the climate scientist. What role do you think climate change did play in these uh, unusually historic alterations to the climate? Yeah, Steve. So uh, I was a part of a study uh, which we, we call as rapid study, uh, um, uh, which was led by uh, Imperial College London, and we have uh, we have. Uh, uh, co-authors from University of Oxford, Cambridge, Princeton, Columbia. So it, it is like a, a kind of a global effort. And uh, our assessment, uh, our, our results were that uh, climate change has uh, uh, increased the rainfall by almost 70% uh, had it, uh, it would have been in the, uh, in the world without climate change. So we have certainly seen the, the footprints of climate change exacerbating the impacts especially over the southern provinces of uh, Sindh and Balochistan. And Steve, let me tell you uh, that uh, this is not the only record-breaking uh, climate uh, extreme event uh, the country has witnessed this year. In the months of uh, uh, March and April earlier this year, we also had an extreme heat wave. It was also a record-breaking extreme heat wave. We almost had, uh, had a, a springless year. And uh, uh, some parts of the country in the months of March and April, which is generally uh, uh, should have been, uh, you know, pleasant uh, 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 months of the year, uh, the country ha the at some places the temperature rose above 50 degrees centigrade, and we did a study for that uh, for that particular uh, heat wave as well, and our results were that climate change made that particular heat wave 30 times more likely. That is so absolutely are... astonishing. All right, let me, let me, Adarsh, I think I see that you've got your, your power back on there, so let's get you back into this conversation. Uh, how much aid is getting through to the people that need it from what you've been able to see? Well, as I've been, I've been mostly, it's just, I mean, with UNICEF, in the case of UNICEF, we've been able to get over 100 metric tons of aid uh, through charter flights, through immediate flights, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, oh, it's nearly $3 million of aid that we have uh, as quick as we could, as soon as we could, we've sent it out. We have uh, set up uh, a warehouse even in uh, in the northern parts of Sindh to make things easier for us. And we can see other organizations also. I mean, I I I, I cannot speak uh, I cannot speak for other organizations as such, but I can see that there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of aid going through. It's uh, we, we we see people getting medical uh, supplies. And in case of UNICEF, for example, we are sending out uh, pregnancy kits. We're sending out uh, mosquito nets. We're sending out medicine, uh, uh, micronutrients, uh, therapeutic food for children. But even even with all the, what I can say is, even with all the aid combined that is reaching people at this moment, it is still not enough. We there is, I mean, it, it could be just uh, a drop in the bucket right now because we have a lot of people, as Sarah mentioned, we have people that are only recorded, uh, that are only accounted for in the camps, and then we have people who are in makeshift shelters. They are they're basically they're not not at home, they're not in camps, they're on the roadside, uh, nobody's reaching them at times uh, because they're not in, in registered camps, no medical aid is sometimes reaching, oftentimes no medical aid is reaching them, no food is reaching them. And what is happening is, is just a, a great gigantic volunteer effort 
in the country. There is a lot of volunteer uh, volunteerism happening. People are uh, donating. People are giving out. But as I mean, because as everyone is mentioning, it's an unprecedented uh, uh, disaster, and we cannot match it just by the volunteerism in the country. So the aid reaching, I'd just say, is is not. Whatever is eating is not enough. That's that's what the situation is right now. Sahar, can I get you to build on that answer in as much as how generous or not you think uh, Pakistan's neighbors or even countries further away have been in terms of meeting the need? Well, I don't think the responsibility is on our neighbors to be generous because they're also um, facing their own climate change uh, disasters as well. I think the responsibility lies with rich, polluting countries um, that have attributed to the kind of uh, rising temperatures we've seen in the world in the last 30, 40 years. Um, uh, you know, specifically the EU, the US, um, China, uh, these countries made um, promises in multiple climate accords over the years, UN climate accords, and they didn't meet their promises. They were supposed to be giving $100 billion a year to climate vulnerable countries to build climate resilient um, climate resilience, and they just didn't do it. It was supposed to start coming in in 2020. And um, the bigger question is of losses and damages, which is a conversation that has been always kept out of uh, UN, uh, UN climate change conversations, which is the losses that are suffered by countries because of climate change, should we be paying them or should the countries that are responsible for rising temperatures be paying it? Pakistan contributes less than 1% to global carbon emissions. Um, most of it is made up by big industrial countries. Uh, the fuel companies in these countries get massive subsidies in trillions of dollars every year. Um, the UN Secretary General uh, just today said that um, it's the responsibility of these industrial countries to tax these um, fossil fuel burning producing companies to pay that money to the most vulnerable countries, maybe in, in, in the form of losses and damages. And we're seeing the we're going to see the conversation going forward here. And Pakistan's going to be leading that conversation, I hope. Um, we have a really um, strong willed uh, climate change minister. You asked is, um, you know, uh, you know, we've been thinking about climate change for years. We actually have a ministry of climate change and we have a minister. She's incredibly smart. Um, she had an op-ed today in the, in the Guardian, and she's going to be pushing the conversation for loss and, losses and damages. And we're seeing for the first time, uh, Denmark is the first country, um, a UN member, that has actually offered $13 million as losses and damages. So I think a lot of countries are realizing their responsibility, um, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm hopeful uh, in the next few months, especially at the next um, big climate change meeting, which is going to happen in November in Egypt, we're going to see... We're going to see some countries take responsibility. Well, Fahad, let me get you to follow up on that answer. And, and Sahar is quite right. Pakistan accounts for less than 1% of the emissions that are causing climate change, and yet it is bearing a disproportionate share of the burden when it comes to the after effects of climate change. What would you like to see the countries that are more responsible for creating climate change do at this moment? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I would say that uh, the, this less than one percent number comes up when you consider the present day uh, uh, present day emissions. Right? What what are happening right now? But if you go uh, for a historical responsibility, if you start from 1850, then the contribution of Pakistan to uh, to uh, global greenhouse emission it reduces to 0.3 percent just to aggravate the number. So historically, Pakistan is not responsible, and the ones uh, who are uh, you know, who contributed least are the most affected, the poorest of the poor. Uh, you know, they are the ones who are suffering the brunt of climate change. And this is a huge problem of climate injustice. And as uh, my uh, fellow speaker has said, that loss and damage is going to be, uh, is very crucial because currently we are 1.2 degrees centigrade warmer than pre-industrial world. That we have to understand. And to bring the temperature to this level, Pakistan has con contributed, or this part of the world has contributed almost 0.3 percent. And uh, uh, th those are being the uh, the people who are, uh, you know, living in mud houses. Uh, they are they are the most vulnerable. Their houses have washed away. So that needs to be understood by the uh, by by the global community. And uh, yes, losses and damage uh, loss and damage discussion is going to be very crucial. And uh, I hope that the countries will come up. But along with that, uh, let me tell you that we also need to reduce emission drastically. So we do, uh, for, for the country like Pakistan, like I have already told you, that we have witnessed two extreme 
calamities this year. And for, for a country like Pakistan, it is uh, not an option to go beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. I mean, it will be a death sentence, especially for the poorest of the poor, uh, the ones at the lowest uh, tercile of the wealth. So unfortunately, geographically, Pakistan is situated at a place where we uh, two of the important uh, weather uh, uh, phenomena terminate. The monsoon uh, starts from Bay of Bengal after crossing uh, India. It terminates over Pakistan. During the winter, we receive very important uh, uh, precipitation in the form of snow, of, which originate from Mediterranean in the west. After passing through, uh, uh, you know, uh, Middle East, they terminate in, in the northern part of the uh, of the country as well. So any fluctuation because of climate change, any variability is gonna impact the country a lot. So it is not only about, uh, you know, uh, flooding, it's not about heat waves, but also uh, the, the melting of snow and glacier in the northern part of the country is also very uh, crucial and the, and the glaciers are melting at a very ra rapid pace. So we are talking about 220 million country at the moment, uh, and uh, which depends on the melting of those snow and glacier in the north. Well, let and me continue the story here with Adarsh because, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess you've got to figure out whether it's possible before the next monsoon, monsoon season comes, whether or not the people who have been displaced by the current tragedy can get into some semblance of housing or get their lives back on track. What's the possibility of any of that happening? Well, that is the very question that we are trying to actually make the world answer here. Because you see, we as the disaster is unprecedented, we know. But we know that we are still in the thick of it. There are towns and cities that are still flooded. There are villages that are still inundated. Uh, there are uh, roads are still submerged. And we have no network uh, in terms of the roads, in terms of reaching people in, in a lot of places. Just to give you a little bit of hint, I just, just a week ago, I was with doctors crossing floodwaters to reach hundreds of people with medical aid who had not seen a doctor for months. And there were children who were uh, who were really in need of immediate uh, medical attention. Uh, but and then this is just this is just the immediate relief question right now. But what you're saying is, and we know that everybody, experts, the government, and everybody saying that the water is going to take months to go, months to recede. And once that water is gone, it'll take again a long time for these people to go back to uh, where they were. And it's not like as as UNICEF has also said in the statement, we have said it that it's not like all these uh, all the people that have been impacted primarily by the floods have uh, have had uh, basic services fulfilled for them, basic needs fulfilled. To them, I mean, we have to look at the country that we we we, we have had a 40 over 40 percent uh, of the children under five in this very province have been stunted, and that has that hasn't gone away with the floods. It has uh, it has it has exacerbated. It is now going to increase. There is a food uh, security crisis uh, that is also looming. Uh, a health crisis is also looming, and then. It, the rebuilding process is not even, we haven't even started thinking about the rebuilding process. Right now, it's just the question of getting the immediate relief to the people in need. And again, the most vulnerable in this crisis have been women and children. And as, as I mean, Father has been the, as the climate expert here, but we know for a fact that more than 90% of the climate related disease burden is also borne by children under five. And so we are in a very complicated situation. Thinking of rebuilding means means that we will have to first cross this barrier where we are right now, have the flash appeal that the UN has sent out completed, have the humanitarian need that is immediately required uh, be present, be, uh, be uh, uh, you know, uh, sent out to the people in need, and then move on to the rehabilitation process. Well, so speaking it's, it's of a, rebuilding, yeah, let me follow up with Sahar on that, because uh, ha has the government put out any estimate of, of um, how much it will cost to try to rebuild the country to what it once was? I mean, the number that they're saying right now is 30 billion, but they say this is the first estimate. I mean, this is the third estimate so far. It just keeps on going up. So 30 billion. So the reason why the number is so large is um, Pakistan is largely an agricultural um, country and a lot of our crop has been destroyed by floods. Um, the 33 million people that have been mostly affected, have, a lot of them have been farm, uh, farm workers and farms are impacted. Cotton is the backbone of our economy. Um, a lot of the, the cotton towels, T-shirts, denim um, you see in many big stores in the West and in Canada, uh, they're actually made, made in Pakistan. And our cotton crop, 50% of it is just gone. 
Um, and it's a similar case with many of our other, um, other crops, our, our, our sugar cane as well. So we're going to be seeing uh, long-term impacts on our economy as well. A lot of the families that we met um, in the flood impacted areas, uh, you know, they hadn't earned anything because they were daily farm workers. They hadn't earned anything in weeks. Hmm. And so, um, so when the government says 30 billion as the first estimate, yeah, I think it's going to go up. And Sahar, what's your, or what's the country's hope as to where that 30 billion is going to come from to help rebuild? Um, well, my hope is climate reparations. When I, when I, when I think of what's fair, um, that's what I see. And I, and I see that the conversations we've been having internationally at these huge climate change forums, we've been having them for decades now, pretty much, um, you know, 70% uh, of my lifetime. But what has come out of it? Like these high profile meetings. And now we're seeing, um, I think Pakistan is the first country that has been impacted at this scale by climate change. So um, Pakistan is an example to show what is the world going to actually do about it. Um, for all these fancy meetings they've been holding year after year for decades, are they going to put their money where their mouth has been all these years? And, and, and I think that this is, this is a real moment for the international community. Well, it's been and relying on burning fossil fuel to, burn, uh, to build their economies. Sure. And, and Fahad, it's not exactly like this is going to be the last climate disaster that takes place. Uh, I presume you've got modeling which suggests that this is the thin edge of the wedge, the first of many more to come? That's correct. So uh, just to uh, add something uh, to the number which Sahar uh, has given you and uh, put the things a little in perspective uh, for, your, uh, for your listeners and audience, that uh, 30 billion is the number which is coming up as, a, as to, uh, the total losses, economic losses uh, due to these floods. But the total exports, the annual exports of Pakistan uh, per year is also around uh, 30 billion. So you can assume that uh, what the country has uh, is going through at the moment. So all the exports, the, the worth of the exports are compromised because of just one extreme event. So, and uh, yes, uh, coming to your question, that, that is certainly the case. The modeling results are showing that uh, there are, there will be many surprises uh, in the future for the country. And uh, as I said before, that the uh, Paris Agreement asked for uh, limiting the global mean temperature to 1.5 degrees centigrade, and currently we are 1.2 degrees centigrade. So every tenth of a degree matters for Pakistan. With every tenth of a degree increase in global warming, uh, Pakistan will witness more and more disaster like these flurrings uh, or, or the heat waves or the uh, gloves, uh, glacial lake outburst floods in the, in the north. And for the first time this year, Pakistan uh, 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 have witnessed uh, the forest fires at scale. So Pakistan is mainly an arid to a, a semi-arid country uh, for most, most, most of its, its area. And having forest fire, fires were also just unprecedented for the country. Hmm. So uh, our modeling results uh, suggest that we are going to witness these kind of extremes in future with global warming. Adarsh, I want to ask you, uh, I guess, a bit of a delicate question, which is, you know, you're, you're with UNICEF. You are accustomed to having to try to get the world's attention to deal with the problems that you deal with on a daily basis, uh, not just fundraising, but awareness raising as well. This has taken place, this tragedy has taken place at a time when a great deal of the world's attention is focused on the death of Queen Elizabeth II. A great deal of the world's attention is also focused on a war between Russia and Ukraine. And you are, you, I mean, let's just say it bluntly, you are trying to attract eyeballs to a life and death situation in Pakistan at the same time. Number one, how difficult is that to do? Number two, are you concerned that these other two things have taken attention away from your cause? Well, I, it's, of course, the, the world usually moves on disaster, disaster, from disaster, from disaster to disaster quite easily. And uh, it's, it's not a pleasant reality, but it is the reality. But what our job is, is to make sure that we keep, uh, we keep telling the story. We keep bringing out the reality. We keep bringing out the truth from wherever we go. As I mentioned just a little while earlier, that I have been with doctors. Our teams are also out there. No, no single place in Pakistan right now that is flooded is, is, uh, 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 is where, I mean, we, we are everywhere when, where we can go. Uh, our teams are on the ground. We're trying to bring attention uh, with the help of the media. There is 
there's a tension right now. Of course, we have international media as well. Right now, I'm speaking uh, with you, and thank you for that, to, to help bring the case of Pakistan uh, uh, to the world and, and, and Canada. But this is, uh, we, that's what we can do. We can just keep pushing. And of course, it's a difficult job. Uh, we, we, but more difficult job is being done by the people on the ground, the, the doctors, the, the aid workers, uh, the, the, the people who are actually reaching people with all the supplies uh, day in, day out. They're working. Uh, there's no breaks for them. Uh, I just just before getting on to this, I was already uh, speaking with the health officials who are, uh, who, as I said, they're trying to find uh, the unreachable so that they can be reached with uh, with medical aid. It is a difficult task on both the end of continuing the work and at the same time trying to make the world understand, as Sarah mentioned, that we need the reparations. We need uh, the aid. We need the uh, the help of the global community uh, to make sure that we come out of this uh, uh, in, in, a, in a better way and be able to help people. So it's 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 quite a difficult job, but I think I think we with the, with climate being an agenda that that the world has now understood and and needs to understand more. We need to unwrap it more, of course, but at least we are now speaking about it openly and 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 uh, thoroughly. That you know this these things are not happening just because they're happening. They, this is a climate disaster. It is uh, uh, it is something that we should all uh, be held accountable for. We should uh, uh, we should also, of course, make sure that this story is it does not stop. Uh, so that's that's. I mean, we just need help from uh, uh, from from your community, from uh, from journalists around the world to to make sure that Pakistan is just somewhere around there because it's it's Pakistan today, but it can definitely be some some other nation, some other country, some other community tomorrow, and that's not something we should wait for. That's that's the that's the message we'd, we'd like to send out. Understood. Well, Sahar, in our last thirty seconds here, uh, you touched on this a while ago, but just tell us what would constitute a successful. COP27 negotiation in Egypt, and what would constitute a failure? Um, a successful one would be Pakistan taking a delegation of indigenous activists and ecologists, people on the front lines, and asking for climate reparations. Um, the government is already collecting information and data on losses and damages, taking that data there and making a good case for countries that are promised to do something about climate change, rich polluting countries, to actually do something about it and lead the way for other countries that are going to be facing the kind of disasters that, that Pakistan has faced this year. We thank all three of you for spending some time with us on TVO tonight and helping to bring this story to the Canadian public's attention. Take good care, everybody, and thank you again. Thank you, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. Tomorrow, has Canada become a haven for money laundering? We'll find out why there's growing concern about that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.